Uh, and uh, we have a slight problem, that is our speaker's not here. Uh, but our understanding is he is on his way from the hospital. He's with an assistant that is, uh, who is driving him here. And Kelly, uh, Connie has just gone out to uh, see if she can locate people. But perhaps it, it, it strikes me that given the size of this audience, and we're just delighted that you're here, that most of you already know a lot about Paul Farmer, and that's what's drawn you here. We've been looking forward to this, uh, a chance to hear from this extraordinary individual. But perhaps in order to, Paul Farmer knows who he is. <laughs> so we don't need to wait for him to, to talk about his background. So we might do some of that now, and then when he comes, we'll be ready to roll. Will that be all right? Yeah. All right, good, good. I, I want to... Uh, so I'm David Gergen, and I want to welcome you here on behalf of the Center for Public Leadership, which is uh, sponsoring this event. And happily, we have co-sponsors that include the Partners in Health, the Hauser Center for Nonprofit Organizations, the Carr Center for Human Rights, and the Harvard School of Public Health, which has increasingly become a, a partner of the Kennedy School on a number of projects. <coughs> But me, we're, we have a, a short audio tape that we plan to play you, and perhaps or, or, perhaps that will give you some better flavor for Paul Farmer. I can only tell you that I didn't know much about him until some months ago when I started hearing about this individual who, who was just transforming people's lives. And, and he kept coming up and told me, do you know about Paul Farmer? Do you understand what he's doing? I did, uh, and then began to learn, and then shortly thereafter, the Tracy Kidder book appeared. And as you know, Tracy, Tracy Kidder is a Pulitzer Prize winner, and has written a number of wonderful books. And he set off to write a book about something else and discovered Paul Farmer, uh, and wound up writing the book called Mountains Beyond Mountains, The Quest of Dr. Paul Farmer, A Man Who Would Cure the World. Perhaps a bit more about his background. He was born in North Adams, Massachusetts. He was the second of uh, six children. And in the mid-60s, when he was young, the family moved south, moved to Alabama uh, to find better work opportunities for his dad. That didn't work out, and they left. And a large bus called the Bluebird. The family went to Florida. The bus was purchased at an auction that had once been used as a mobile TV clinic. Well, the family lived on the boat, on the bus, and later on a boat in Florida. It has been said that there were, no, I think he may be here. There are, yes, he is. Oh. couch potatoes in your family when you were young because there was no couch. Outside, there was a couch outside. There was a couch outside. <laughs> he has, uh, about 11 years ago, he was re uh, received the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant for $200,000. I've often wondered what happened to those genius grants after they were awarded. Paul Farmer had donated the entire sum to Partners in Health to, in order to expand that organization, and that's been a typical of the way he has lived for a long, long time. As a bachelor, he indeed lived in the basement of Partners in Health, even after he met his wife, Dee Dee Bertrand, a Haitian woman. They continued to live in the basement until their daughter was born in 1998. Does she have a couch? Yes. She doesn't. Right. I will. He is. He is a medical anthropologist, a physician. He, he is professor of the currently the Presley Professor of Medical Anthropology in the Department of Social Medicine at the Harvard Medical School, and as you know, his impact extends far beyond Cambridge with his work. If we might, if we might indulge you, sir, just we'll take a few moments. I'd like. We'd like to play a very brief piece of a 
take from fresh air, which I think introduces him more than anything I could say. So, the roll take coming? Well, in 1988, three people from right around the clinic died of tuberculosis. And that was um, a very traumatic experience for me, for the, at that time we had only one do, uh, doctor, and uh, for the community health workers on whom we relied. And there were several nurses at the time. And we got together and said, what happened here? How could we lose three otherwise healthy young people, parents with kids, how could we lose them to this eminently treatable disease? And it was interesting, there were all these discrepant theories as to what had happened. And uh, some people, and it was really mostly the professionals, they tended to blame the patients and they brought up this whole idea of, you know, they believe in voodoo and they're superstitious and that's why they die of tuberculosis even though they have free care. But the community health workers who shared the social conditions of the patients who died, they didn't agree, by and large. They said, no, these are the poorest patients who died. And when we started looking harder that year at, at our so-called free TB treatment program, we found all kinds of hidden costs. For example, we found that it costs money to get to the clinic if you were too sick to walk. And even, even if you could walk, you know, for three hours, you, you're not doing something else. If you're a peasant farmer, you're not planting, you're not hoeing. Uh, but for people who, had, who couldn't walk, they had to, they had to pay. Uh, to, to borrow a donkey. And then we found that, you know, they were, at that time we were using a drug called streptomycin. Uh, it's not used as widely anymore. It's a good TB drug. But you have to give it as an injection. And we found out that they were paying people to give them the injection in the, in the village. And so what we did is we, we just eradicated every single barrier to free care. And then we felt we could have an honest conversation, but only after we made the care really free to the patient could we have an honest discussion as to why these people died. And so I have to say, you know, since that time, since we overhauled the project, we haven't lost patients to tuberculosis. Why do you, though, um, do that kind of work? Why, why are you doing hands-on work in the clinic now and, and visiting patients in, uh, in, in faraway regions? I would think your time is very short. You have this, this, this this huge project that you, you help administer and fundraise for? What did I say? <laughs> uh, I do it because I like it. It's my favorite part of the work. The clinical work. Patients in their homes. Or really, I don't even, they're not homes, they're huts. But, and, I, and as you said, I, we get some of our best ideas by walking a long way and thinking about what patients must be going through. If I could give you one example, I remember the day distinctly um, that I um, ran into a patient who had a child on her arm and she had, the child I think was about three and she had come from the clinic and, uh, and I offered, because she looked so, the, the woman had looked sick herself and the child was sick and she, she had not been seen at the clinic, she brought her kid there. And I said, can I, can I help you carry the baby? And uh, she, you know, she threw me this look, first of all, incredulous, and then grateful. And after, and it was a three-hour hike to her home village. And after a half an hour of carrying this three-year-old, who was a, a malnourished child, my arm started to hurt. And after an hour of carrying that child, my arm was really killing me. And, um, and so, you know, I, I, being not sick, I did make it all the way to that village, the rest of the way, with the kid on my arm. And, um, and I sat down, and I was you know, fanning myself with a piece of paper I had, and I, and I said to her, um, well, you know, my arm hurts from carrying that child, from carrying your baby. Do doesn't it hurt your arm? And she said, if I go to your clinic with my, one of my children, one of my in infants, my arm hurts for weeks afterwards. And you know, I, it had never occurred to me before. I never thought about it. And I can think about all these things I learned from, you know, on the way to these villages that are obviously very far away from the fundraising or the international conferences or the, the, you know, the work that is regarded as really important by some. But I think you do learn things by sticking close to the patients and their conditions. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Farmer, welcome to Morning Katie. take credit for such a bad title. Uh, I need to take credit for that myself. Um, I've had a number of quite amused comments on the title. Um, I, did, I did it myself. I, look, I, I was tired of using, I wanted to think of something new. I knew sort of what I wanted to say. I have a friend who works, former, he's a former seminarian, I don't know if he's here, he works at Partners in Health, he's, he is a, a fundraiser. He looked at it and said in his great Chelsea accent, that's just Paul trying to be a priest. <laughs> I don't know if he's here. I just heard that today. I just got back. And I'm sorry to be late. I, I went through from the airport to the hospital and was seeing patients. I th actually, I'm not technically late, I think. And, um, and it's this, the same sort of uh, bracing uh, exchange of going from, uh, going from rural Haiti to... Uh, to Harvard has been really the one that's informed uh, my journey, and you know, it's not. This is talk will not be about my journey. You'll be relieved to know. Um, and uh, our work is certainly not about any individual journeys, but the work of a lot of people. In fact, um, I the next uh, image I want to show you. Let's see if I can get this right. Said. I certainly remember the story. The story about the three people dying of tuberculosis is central to our organization's experience, both in Haiti and elsewhere in, uh, later, and I'll talk about uh, really this ridiculous title, Discernment and Audition. Um, but uh, community health workers have really uh, been the heart, at the heart of a lot of the projects that our group has been working, uh, in which our group has been working. And when I say our group, there are quite a a number of people from Partners in Health here tonight. There are people from the Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is where I just hailed from, um, um, from the fourth floor of that hospital. Um, and, uh, and there are people here from the medical school, um, and we are working with people in other parts of the university as well. Uh, but often when we say our, we mean um, the people who are being served in each of these places. And I'll thought in order to to give this talk, which is supposed to be about leadership, and again, I don't. I, if 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 I'm going to talk about leadership, I have to start by saying that um, the, the talk is meant to say that people living in poverty are de facto experts on poverty. Um, people living with um, various afflictions, the, the ones that I see uh, in Haiti or here or in Peru, they are uh, automatically, in in some important sense, experts. Now, I know this has been pretty much accepted by the academic communities that, again, I'm working I'm often between a place like rural Haiti and, and, and this one. Um, and I know that people uh, agree in principle, 
But I do, I, I do believe that one of the problems in, setting, in, in leadership in setting policy is that it's really in theory or in principle or sometimes even in style to say these things, but not actually to follow through on listening. And that's why I suspect you chose to play those epiphanies, because that's what they were. Now here I'm sounding like the Catholic theologian again, sorry. Um, but uh, in each of the places that I'd like to, to talk about in terms of leadership in, in, in responding to public problems, I mean, there are, I'm sure there are many private problems that people have, and some private problems be, stack up so that they, be, they become public problems. Or sometimes it's because private people are so powerful that their um, private problems be become public ones. I mean, you can go through the long list. I've just had this, again, this jarring experience of coming from Haiti to the United States and, you know, reading the newspapers. I actually didn't come directly from real Haiti. I went by New York and I read The New Yorker today. Um, and some, some of you will have read, I didn't read the whole thing, okay, I read Anthony Lane, his movie reviews, but I read the <laughs> Seymour Hirsch piece and, and some of the other, and I saw it in the New York Times and Miami Herald yesterday too. And we're living in this world where obviously uh, leadership from people who might be gathered in a place like this one, in a school like this one, uh, and particularly this school, um, where their, their opinions matter a great deal, inordinately one might say. I mean, why, for example, uh, would the opinion of someone who was, say, at the medical school, the school of public health, or the case school, why would their uh, opinion about tuberculosis matter more than, you know, uh, someone who's lost a family member to, to, to tuberculosis? Um, and we all know that, uh, that we could spend a lot of time reflecting on that, but it, that there are these enormous discrepancies in power and privilege that really characterize the world that we can read about in the New York Times, the New Yorker, or, or hear about in, in, on a radio station in Haiti, as I did uh, just a few days ago. Now, I wanted to start this exploration of discernment, of weighing various pro dilemmas. And I think that's what this is about. And if I were a student here, um, I would have, that's what I would have, studied, because that's what I study now, I think about now, and I would have been able to do it with a community of scholars and a, a different literature, policy literature. I would have tried to say, well, how do we weigh problems and juxtapose them and decide which ones merit which interventions, which is a lot of that gets done here. It happens in public health and medicine as well. And I want to take the most extreme example first. And, uh, and, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, there's not a lot, don't worry, there are not a lot of slides. I'm only using these to remind me what I'm talking about. And this is the most jarring example. Some of you will recognize this. Um, this is an exhumation of someone who's been murdered in Guatemala. This is a Partners in Health project. And I'll tell you, um, if 20 years ago, uh, when I had been starting Harvard Medical School, someone said, you will one day, after your medical training, after you've finished your internship, residency, and fellowship in infectious disease, spend time on people who are already dead, I would have laughed. I would have said, that's just not possible. And I'm not going to medical school to, uh, to do work with people who are already dead. Well, this is what happened. This is a, again, discernment and audition. And there's got to be a better way of saying that than the, one of the people who made such a comment. I can see her in the back there right now. And I trust her opinion. She's right. She said, oh, I remember what she said because she wrote me an email in Haiti last week and she said, why didn't you just call, learning, call it learning to listen to the poor? And that's, of course, what I really should have done. Thank you, Jim. But this, this is an example of this question of, you know, we went to Guatemala and we here, I, actually, I don't think the director of Partners in Health is here tonight. Um, don't see her. Um, but uh, I... Jody Hymanet is not here tonight, but there were a, this, a small we, people um, you know, from this community, uh, had been working with Guatemalan refugees in, in Chiapas, in Mexico, and this since the late 80s. So I was, a, again, a medical student at the time. I started medical school in 1984 and, and was in the MD-PhD program, and, and I was still right in the middle of in the thick of all this. When a man with whom we'd worked on, on the Mexican side of the border was, as they say in the special locution of Spanish made up for this part of the world, was disappeared. Now, I remember this, is, this event happened in 1989. And in 1989, a couple of the 
founders of Partners in Health are here, they'll remember uh, this as well. Um, we didn't know what to do. We were working with community health workers, and uh, they were poor people, like the ones in Haiti. And we had, we felt that, you know, in 1989, we, I hope we didn't say things like this, but we thought, well, 1989, we've already had five or six years of experience working with community health workers in Haiti. We're really experienced. Little do we know that that was nothing in this world. And one of our collaborators has disappeared and never heard from again, I might add. So the punchline is not a happy one. And uh, so we asked people who are our friends, actually on the faculty mostly, um, people here uh, at the School of Government, people in the university's administration, influential, powerful people with connections to Washington and other places. Well, what do we do? You know, we're, our co this is a co-worker. His, it was a witnessed abduction on the Mexican side of the border in a place called Tapachula. And so we did the things that we were told to do. Contact Senator Kennedy, contact Senator Kerry, con you know, write letters to Amnesty International, describe the details of his abdu abduction, interview his, his widow. We did all those things. And nothing, I mean, nothing came of it except confirmation. And, and I can't even tell you the details. And you may have heard similar stories from Jen Jennifer Harbury, who's spoken here. But anyway, he, he never was our coworker again. Um, he never came back. And some years later, however, this, and this, is, this picture was taken just last year. Some years later, we went back um, with a number of our friends the Guatemalan refugees who had been working in Chiapas, Mexico. As you know, many of them went back after the war. I say after with quotation marks, just because, as you know, the war against the poor continues there. But after the cessation of some of the most violent parts of the war, a number of Guatemalan refugees went back. And we didn't go with them, although some people from here did actually go with them to, to just be body blocking and protecting. We went back to meet with a team of community health workers who had survived the war, and they wanted to do another Partners in Health project in, in, uh, in Guatemala. And, and we said, okay. And we, we, I remember we, this, on this particular trip, we went to Chiapas, and I'd never flown to, to Guatemala, only to Chiapas, and we crossed the border on foot, and our, our uh, co-worker met us there, the, the widow of the man that not this has nothing to do with his grave, but the widow of the man that I told you about, she met us, and uh, you don't need to hold the mic, good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thank you. So the, uh, the widow met us there, uh, obviously we're not thinking of her as the widow, um, uh, that's not the way she presented herself, this was many years later. She was the widow nonetheless, and, uh, and we had a wonderful evening with with her and her father and surviving some of her surviving siblings. One of her brothers was, was killed at, at 18 years of age as part of the, um, the rebel group in Guatemala. He was 18 and his body was displayed like a, a hunting trophy for some days. We heard that that evening. Anyway, we, but we actually had a very, they had a concert for us with a marimba and uh, we had a very good time. And the next day we went to this meeting. And I'd like to describe the meeting in a little bit of detail. Um, because it's painful, and it's painful particularly to recount it here. Um, we went into a place called Santa Ana Juista, I think, and it was not far from Huehuetenango. And, uh, and that's where we'd stayed the night uh, before. And it was up on a hill, muddy hill, there's no road. And we went to a church, a Catholic church, and inside the church there was a workshop going on. And it was a gender sensitivity workshop. <laughs> And the people doing the workshop were clearly, they looked a lot like, like us. They had on blue jeans. I, I actually did not have on blue jeans, but you know what I mean. They, they had, they had, their hair didn't look like the people from that area. It looked, 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 looked not like my hair because mine's kind of gone. But um, they had uh, look, hair that looked very European. And they looked European. And they were taller than all the other people. One of the reasons we're taller is because all the other people there who were Mayans, who were Indians, they were sitting in these little children's desks. You know, you've seen these kids for these little desks. For the, you know, I'm not complaining about the desks. I'm just pointing out that you, you know, you walk into this scenario. There's, um, and you see, you, you know, we're sitting there, and uh, actually, one of my students, who um, who is now a um, emergency room doctor, he he was a medical student at the time. He's a Chicano from um, Los Angeles, and he. He uh, had been there for some time, and he met us. He was the fourth person with us. 
and partners in health. And uh, they're sitting in these little desks, and the workshop is going like this. The women from the city, from Guatemala City, were speaking the languages of Harvard University, or the Ford Foundation, or, you know, just utterly recognizable to us. It sounded, you know, it sounded like something that, that we might hear, here, here. And they were asking the people who were all adults and crammed into these little tiny chair desks to draw pictures from their childhood, ch their, their childhoods. Now remember, these are people who had all narrowly survived massacres. And they, most of them were women. Um, and there were some men, including the father of our friend, he was there. And, uh, and they were, some of them needed translators, actually, because they couldn't speak Spanish. They were speaking their own languages, and a couple of them needed translators. And I'm trying to describe this as neutrally as I can. You know, I really am trying. Um, and I won't, I, like, for example, I won't tell you what color my neck turned or anything like that. Um, but this is exactly what we saw, and, we, and, and this is what happened. So they'd say, all right, who would be next? And the, and the, the, the women from the city. Um, and they would ask someone to stand up. Sometimes they'd need a translator, sometimes not. And they'd show a picture. And it would be a picture, say, of a little house and a garden with some flowers. And, uh, and, and, and then the, the interlocutor from Guatemala City would say in Spanish, you know, what, what does this mean? And so sometimes there's a translator, sometimes not. And, and the answer would be, well, this is my house where I grew up. And I, was, you know, I had nine brothers and sisters. And, and, uh, we, and this is where we used to do our chores and do gardening. And, uh, and, he, and she said, um, and, and, you know, what happened then? Um, you know, as if the, you know, the, uh, the facilitator, that was the word they were using, the facilitator knew something that certainly I didn't know. She said, well, then my mother died. And then what happened to you? Well, then, you know, it was harder for all of us because my mother is the one who used to, you know, you know, take care of us, and, and you know, we, she was our mother. And, and, uh, and the facilitator said, well, did your, I bet your father treated you differently because you were a girl. And she said, no, not really. Um, we all had to do, to chip in and do the chores. And, and anyway, this was, you know, there was a, clearly there was a grid, a template, an interpretive framework, that, which, which you use with any for, uh, workshop. I, you know, I'm not saying it's different when you're seeing, as I was an hour ago, a woman with a fever that had no explanation. You're, you're using a template of your own fabrication to try and figure out what that fever is coming from. But this is what was happening, and it became more and more uncomfortable because the facilitators were trying to steer the direction every time in one way, whereas the people who had drawn the pictures in the little uh, chairs were trying to steer it another way. Now, I, I just was becoming very uncomfortable, and, and I, I, I was looking at the director of Partners and Health, and she was becoming very uncomfortable. We didn't say a word. This wasn't our workshop. And about five minutes too long into this, after it was very grueling, someone came to get us for the reason we'd been there, which, which was for a meeting, and uh, a meeting with the, the health committee. And so we went to the meeting, and as we were crossing the courtyard to another part of the ch of church, which actually where they were cooking, so we were, <laughs> we were coughing, they were making these beans and things. And, and, uh, and I said to the director of Partners in Health, I said, you know, I hope they're not going to ask us to fund things like this, because, you know, and, and I, I don't know if I was thinking about those community health workers. Probably not, but maybe you will, having heard this clip. I said, I don't, didn't come here to try and change the mentality of the victims. That's not, that's not, this is, this is, genocide has just happened here, 200,000 people dead. And I, and I, I didn't say this loud, and I said it in English, and I said it to Ophelia. I said, I did not come here to change the mentality of the victims. That's not the kind of project that we should be working on, I don't think. And then we get in there, and to make a long story short, which is not my strong point, um, we sat down with these veterans of this experience, and they said, we want to do a mental health project. And we were relieved, because we, you know, Partners in Health has been working a lot on, on infectious disease, but we, we don't have a, a some, we're, we're not an infectious disease group, you know. Um, we worked on infectious disease because that's what we found listening to the poor of Haiti, oh, those 20 some odd years ago. That's why I went into this, that field, infectious disease. And that sounded great to us, mental health. And I, and I said, well, you know, what, what sort of project did you have in mind? And they said, we want to 
dig up the bodies of the dead. And we went, you want to do what? We want to dig up the bodies of the dead. We want to exhume our family members who were killed during this war and never buried properly because we can't have community mental health if our family hasn't been properly buried properly. And what's more, some of the people who killed them live in the same villages with us still. We live right next door to the people who tormented our families. And, you know, of course, I was trying not to bawl. And, uh, I mean, it's not, it's not exactly what, what I was expecting to hear. And, you know, I, Ophelia, the director of Partisan Health, um, said, yeah, we'll help with that project. And so, 20 years after starting, a, you know, uh, at Harvard Medical School, here I was, lat later on that night, writing letters, fundraising letters, from Weiwei Tenango, looking for funding to dig up the dead. And you can, let me just say, it's not a ranking priority for many major <laughs> foundations. <laughs> And, you know, back to the, the question of how does one spend one's time, you know, if, where, where would you have heard that? Now, you could have heard that there were for big forensic ex, you know, experts working there, but they were saying, no, we can't do it that way. We want, this is for our, our community. And, as I said, I wanted to start with the most extreme example, because when, when you are trying to be discerning, to actually listen um, to people who have gone through horrible things like these people had, and I mean, again, I'm not an, uh, I'm not an expert on this this topic, but you know, living and in, in working in rural Haiti has certainly made me a sort of uh, uh, for the Haitians here a de facto expert on uh, on violence and and uh, what happens when there's great deal of division within a community. I found that argument that this was an important mental health project to be a very compelling argument. I was utterly convinced when I heard it, and. And yet, the first part of that morning had been very painful for us. And I wondered, I mean, I didn't wonder, I didn't say, let's go back and talk to those people from Guadalupe City and say, you know, you really ought to, you know, rethink your project. Of course we wouldn't do that. We, 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 it's not what we're about. But we're, I think one of the reasons that our group has gotten into some of these very strange, um, the way the, the, the map I just showed you looks, is because one thing leads to another. And when you are listening to people who are living in poverty, as all of these people were, they were also the, the survivors of a terrible war and, and, and genocide, but when you actually listen, you just learn things that you're not going to learn uh, in some of these other circles, in which I move really quite easily, as, you, as, as, I, as I have to say candidly, I move very easily in, in circles, I hope, like this one, and, and, uh, and, and in other places where, um, uh, where there's a great deal of affluence and, and privilege and power. Example one. And let's see if I can. Wait. Now, a little, uh, one more word on this example is uh, I don't mean to be grisly in any way, and that, that's uh, you know obviously this is one of the, the dangers of talking about violence in general. And uh, you know I, I found myself in a in a uh, thank you. I found myself in a very public forum saying. I, I, I was talking about violence and, I, and talking about what was going on in Haiti and someone asked me a question that really was completely impertinent, not in the sense of being that people should be pertinent and respectful, but it was impertinent to the discussion, that's all. And I said, hey, I haven't hit anybody since seventh grade. <laughs> this was at uh, Yale University. Everybody <laughs> laughed. So, you know, I, I uh, got in, in, involved in this work really against my will and only because, again, Discern, the discernment and audition process that is learning to listen to poor people takes you places you'd never expect to go. I mean, exhuming bodies and reburying them. You know, could you imagine going to uh, a funder and saying, well, yes, it's really a very cost-effective health, mental health intervention program. We have the data on that. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons, I think, that, uh, you know, it, the, there, there are problems in policy and problems in policy leadership is because you never know what you're going to hear. And leadership is not merely the province of people with power. I mean, there are there are many people who are called to lead who are living themselves in great power, uh, poverty rather. And as I've said, many of them are uh, experts in the subjects at hand for all sorts of awful reasons. Now I'm going to switch to the other end of the spectrum, and that this is this is Roxbury. This is actually taken in, in, a, in, a hospital, in the hospital I just came from, but you'll recognize some of these people maybe, and some of you, um, some of the people in this picture may be here tonight. But I wanted to go to 
from one extreme to the other. This is a, this is a pro project based in Roxbury. And I'm going to start it by telling a, a patient's story, if I can, and um, mention that uh, you know I go between Harvard and Haiti, as you heard, and I get to attend at this fantastic hospital. And, uh, but I see things there that really are quite disturbing. I mean, for example, the last uh, year ago, February, I came back, uh, and on my first day there, first day back from Haiti, saw a man with advanced AIDS who had never received antiretrovirals and had come into this great teaching hospital for, I think, the fourth time with a disease called neurotoxoplasmosis. Now, some of you here know what that means, but what, what it means is that he had very advanced AIDS and he had repeated bouts of a brain parasite that can be controlled fairly well with antiretroviral medications that you keep reading about and also with other drugs. But what had happened is he'd come in several times and he'd go back home and he didn't speak English and he didn't have anyone visiting him and his, his life was chaotic. Even though I f we found out that his wife was fantastic. I mean, she and the, their children were there a lot, uh, many of the days uh, that I was there. But the day I saw him, February 1, it was, he was, I thought he was dying. I thought, what a shame. You know, you look at his history and he's already, there's three warnings. And on one of those warnings, he actually went to the, the neurosurgical ICU and had a shunt placed in his brain to relieve the pressure. And, I mean, this is, these are heroic medical interventions. And at, the, at one of, I don't know, I think it's a fantastic hospital and, and fantastic surgeons, fantastic ICUs. And then what would happen? He'd go out, he'd go home, and nothing. So it'd be feast or famine, you know, like rural Haiti, Harvard. Only this time it was Brigham North Shore. And so I called Heidi Beferus, who's all, probably seeing a patient right now, but she's the director of the project I'm about to describe to you. And she went to Harvard Medical School and then to the Brigham. And, and then she started a project to take care of people a lot like this man. People who could find medical care in a sense. They could go to the best hospitals in the world. They could get the best medications in the world. But something always happened. Because, you know, if you used to look at uh, run an AIDS service uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, people who were in the hospital were often young men, usually white. Nowadays, the people in the hospital with HIV disease are people of color, and mo more than half of them are women. And, you know, there, there, are, there have been wonderful advances in care of this disease. But in order for them to be effective, they have to be delivered correctly, and in this case, every day and more than once a day. Anyway, so I talked to the wife that night, I, and, and I said, you know, I, I, I'm, he, he, you know, to give it for the physicians here, this man had complete aneuria. He had, his, his kidneys were not functioning at all. He was having seizures from the brain parasite, and again, he'd never had any treatment to, for his immune system. And not out of lack of trying, let me tell you, the people who had taken care of him, uh, you know, had said, Every time, whenever he got into the Brigham, I mean, people had taken wonderful care of him. And I said, you know, I, I can't be optimistic because I don't know if his kidneys are going to come back and you know, we're going to do everything we can. But then I, uh, then I called Heidi Beferus. And she and two of these people in this picture showed up the same day. And to make a long story short, he survived. And he did fine. He stopped having seizures, his kidney function went back to normal, we put him back on the treatment for the brain parasite, and then, and this is why he has never since been back in the hospital, he started having a Haitian-style community health worker go visit him every day and give him his meds. Same story, different place. That is, you know, we can blame, and you know, there, was, there were people in the medical system here who had blamed his poor outcomes on him. I mean, you've heard it. He's non-compliant. He's not adherent. He's not with the program. And there's a whole vocabulary that, again, is it, it'd be the version you'd get if your audition and discernment was listening instead of learning to listen to the poor, learning to listen to the doctors, you know, or or the social workers or the nurses. I and mean, it's hard work. You know, you want people to do well if you're a social worker or a nurse. Actually, you know, the, one of the nurses who'd been delivering care or trying to was really quite angry at this couple. This is not in the hospital. This was uh, in their home. And, but they were, it turns out they weren't home one day when they had a point with her because they were getting evicted from their apartment, of course. You know, it's always something like that. But I have to say, since this approach, which was developed in Haiti by learning to listen to poor people, that is, when the community health worker said, no, 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 these people didn't die because they believe in sorcery. They did believe in sorcery, by the way, as an aside. But that's not why they died. 
That's not why they died at all. And that's the point that the community health workers were making. They died because they have no food, they have no donkey, they have no one to take care of their kids. But, and in this case, it was a different set of problems, but social problems they were nonetheless. And you wouldn't know them if you didn't listen. And, you know, this is, and th this family lives in poverty by Boston standards. They hail from another country in the Caribbean, not, not Haiti, another one very close by. In fact, connected. And, uh, <laughs> but they were living in, you know, American-style poverty. And, and again, I, what strikes me is in both of those instances, and in fact in all three instances, Haiti on the, the audio interview, Guatemala, um, and, and this one from Boston is there's goodwill all around. I mean, there's no question that the doctors and nurses in Haiti wanted to cure the patients of TB. And there's no question that the, the neurosurgeon, I mean, the neurosurgeon, there are neurosurgeons in other hospitals who say, we're not going to operate on people with AIDS, you know, because it's not worth it. That, that would never happen. As I've never heard it once happen at the Brigham. And so a lot of effort, and you know, if I would, didn't do the math, but if you were an economist, and you were studying this, and you'd say four admissions to, uh, you know, uh, one of them to an intensive care unit. You can only imagine how much it costs to do a bad job. How much does it cost to do a bad job? How much does it cost in terms of mental health problems to do a bad job after a war? How much does it cost to do a bad job promising people in rural Haiti that they will no longer die of a readily treatable disease and then to fail? How much does it cost to do a bad job with people living here? who have to face racism, gender inequality, linguistic problems. And that, I, I think, is, is, if there's a, that's the theme that I'd like to bring out from these examples, is that it costs a lot, and we, and we still don't know how to measure how much it costs. The intervention I just mentioned, a community health worker. Now, uh, when, when the Haitian community health workers found out the ones in Boston actually had cars instead of donkeys, they were amazed. And the cell phone thing really blew them away. But I, I, I won't, wouldn't be surprised if 10 years from now, uh, if I am spared and invited back here, that I'll report to you that the Haitian health workers also have mobile phones now. That'll happen. And a lot of them, I got an email at the Brigham from my community health worker just about three hours ago. And I just left there. Um, and this is the intervention. You know, you go to someone's house and, and, uh, and make sure they get their meds. And, uh, and that's, that's really, and it's been impossible to fund. People have said, well, you know, it's too expensive. The salaries for the community health workers are too, exp too expensive. And we've been saying, we need to scale this up. This is important. As we said it's important for the city. You know, it's important for the teaching hospital. It's important for Boston Public Hospital, uh, Boston City Hospital, everywhere. But it's been very difficult to fund because it's, it's held to be too labor intensive and too expensive. And the reason that it's considered not too expensive in Haiti is because the labor is so cheap there. But otherwise, you, you know you'd be hearing the same thing, thing, thing there. Same thing there, and I'll give you an example from. Now this is in between, in a way, uh, in extremity. This is Peru. And we, we ended up there through a, a, it's a long story. Um, they all are, I must say. <laughs> but it was, uh, again, another one of those freakish things, too bizarre to imagine. Someone comes back from this area related to partners in health and up and dies of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis after working in this slump. Dies right here in a Boston hospital. That does, that's not something you see very often in Boston, I'll tell you. Someone dying of tuberculosis. And, uh, and so we went back to the, to the place where he'd been working and, and this, you know, into this community and we found all these people who look like this, and this, this the, the doctor here is actually not a doctor at the time, but a third year medical student, Sonia Shin, who is now, I'm sure, one of the world's leading experts on tuberculosis, on this particular form of tuberculosis, but on any form of tuberculosis, this is Dr. Sonia Shin. Um, but this is probably eight or nine years ago, when she was a third year student and one of the, one of the patients, and we found hundreds and later thousands of young people who had what's called multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And some of you have heard this story. I don't know, I, even here I've told this story and I, I promise to tell it in abbreviated form, but we, the point here is, here you have again a picture of this bizarre term audition. Only this is not auditioning for a Broadway show, this is just listening. And here you have a community outreach worker, this time a Peruvian, not a Guatemalan or a Haitian or a Dominican living in uh, Dorchester, but a Peruvian community health work, worker listening to one of the patients tell his story about what it was like to be told that he had a disease that wasn't treatable. 
and he ought to just give up. And it, you know, this is an example, um, you know, of how clear it was made. And this was this is policy. You know, this is being set by people like me. You know, MDRTB means multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, but it's too expensive to treat. You know, it's not cost effective. It's not a perfect technology. The, li the list is long. It'll make you think of another disease in a minute. And should you not think of that disease, I will force you to in about two minutes. But now, the big question I think that comes up a lot if you're listening to people living in poverty is they almost never say things like this. I, I, well, let me just put it more starkly. I have never had anyone tell me in Haiti or Peru or Russia, Doc, if that's the disease I have, forget it. I'm then, you know, whatever. I'm Haitian, and it's not cost-effective to give me these drugs. <laughs> Never once. I, only, but, you know, I hear it regularly outside of said sites, usually in sites like these. And, you know, it's, it's important that we, hear, we don't hear this from people living in poverty. And not just people living with the afflictions, but people living in poverty. And, uh, and again, that's part of the, the tension that I'm trying to describe between our world and their world. Because I don't fool myself for a minute. I mean, I live in a a village among people who live in poverty, but I'm not poor. I can take American Airlines and get upgraded on my way back here just because I fly there so much, you know, and have bad red wine in first class within, you know, four hours of leaving, you know, said miserable squatter settlement. I, I, don't, I don't have confusion about that. I do not live in poverty. I will never live in poverty. And even though I did have a couch outside, I never did live in poverty. Now, is this, these kind of comments are never heard from the people I'm talking, saying we should listen to. So, if, but say for example you wanted to take the first one of these and say, well, it's true, isn't it? I mean, it, look at that. It says, in developing countries, people with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis usually die. Well, that's true. It's not a false statement. Because treatment, effective treatment is often impossible in poor countries. Also true. But is this the beginning of a conversation or the end of one? And if you were to make it the beginning of one, and you'd already worked for some years in rural Haiti, you'd say, well, hey, why don't we ask the community health workers? And some of you will recognize Jim Kim, who was here just a few days ago, and will be back here, I think, on Thursday, who is now head heading up a major effort to scale up some of the interventions that you're, you're hearing described here that, that come from listening to poor people. But these are young people. This, by the way, I'm just trying to get an assessment here. Is my hair really falling out that fast? No, this is 1997. Um, this is 1996, actually, I think. 1996. Um, and these are um, young people from this neighborhood. And they, be, they became, they did the work that I described being done in Roxbury and Dorchester and Haiti and, uh, and elsewhere. They started delivering the right medicines to the people who needed them. Now, and was it impossible? And did it require... And, and, and after all, if I'm working in Haiti in 1996, 97, and Jim and I are all over the place, how, how could we be providing the leadership? We weren't. This is Dr. Jaime Bayona, who is the director of Partners in Health in Peru, who will also be here Saturday. I, and uh, um, we're having, actually, all of you are invited to a symposium that's called Collateral Benefits. And we're going to talk about what happens when you try to start virtuous social cycles in places like, like these ones, on Saturday at the medical school in this giant new building that was recently built on Avenue Louis Pasteur at 8, at 10, nine, nine. at 9, 9 o'clock. <laughs> anyway, you're all invited. But this is Jaime Bayona. He'll be there to talk. And he provided leadership and helped transform Partners in Health uh, Peru into uh, what I believe is Peru's largest health NGO, the whole country. I, I think that's true. And there was, we had to pull together this coalition, and this is a boring, boring slide that involved, you know, who makes the drugs? Well, the pharmaceutical company makes the drugs. You know, and you, um, sanctimony wins you nothing, you know, if you're struggling for poor people. So I could say, well, the, the, the drug companies are never going to give us drugs. They're never gonna, but that's not very helpful to people who need the drugs. So we didn't do that. We, said, we kept on calling them and calling them and faxing them and emailing them. And one day they said to us, okay... We'll, leave you the, we'll give you the drugs already. Will you please stop faxing, phoning, calling, <laughs> pestering? And they did. They gave us the drugs. And then we, we were shocked for a bit. You know, we had to you know, sort of rally ourselves, saying, wait a second, that wasn't supposed to happen. But it did happen. And then we, we actually said some other things. Maybe we'll have time to talk about it afterwards. We said, well, help us transfer the technology to poorer countries who have this problem. And they said, okay. And then we realized that we really didn't know a lot about technology transfer. And, Again, we're a little bit shocked, but 
you know, let this be a lesson. I mean, it was a lesson to us, again, another one of these epiphanies. This one, I think, coming in a way also from poor people who, who were saying, go get the drugs. I remember in 1996, when it was clear that combination therapy for AIDS would, would save people's lives, that's what they said, go get us the drugs. No one said, oh, we know it's not cost effective. So, I mean, maybe they'd say, we know it's not going to be easy. Some people did say that to me in Haiti. But they didn't, it was all about get, get, find a way to make it work. And, and, and on their end, I have to say, I think they made it work. Last example, and then I, I, I'm going to, uh, I want to close. Um, this is just, now how on earth would you end up here? I mean, many of you recognize this. This is in a um, Siberian prison. And uh, it's a TB ward. And this is a place where, interestingly enough, this hard-won medical expertise that I mentioned, Sonia and the community health workers and Dr. Bayan and many others, turns out that about half these guys who have active tuberculosis have multidrug-resistant tuberculosis. And, it, you know, first we heard it was maybe 5% and then 10%. Don't worry about it. We can fix this. We don't have to. It's just 10 percent, 15 percent. And we, then we actually got the lab data, and we said, "Wow, we're in." We thought Peru was bad. Of course, the burden of disease is much higher in Peru and Africa and Haiti, but the complexity of managing this disease is really—it's enough. Again, either either you're starting the conversation or you're ending ending it. But if you're starting it, it's a very complex conversation. As you can as I think you can tell from the, the brief example. And that's how we ended up doing the same thing there. Now, interestingly enough, here we are in a, in a, in a country and in Siberia. Uh, I'm embarrassed to tell some of these stories. Not so embarrassed, however, that I won't tell them. But, uh, you know, where you get off the plane. I mean, I, I flew Tomsk Air to Tomsk, which would be like flying, you know, Dubuque Air to Dubuque. <laughs> it's really weird. You know, there was an airline for every you know, suburb, practically. I mean, again, you guys from the case will know more about this, but evidently with these central command economies, they'd say things like, let there be an airline, or let there be a subway, and then boom, there was a subway. So, you fly to Tomsk on Tomsk Air. Tomsk, which is, you know, not a lot of people. It's the size of Poland, mind you, but there are only a million people living there. And, uh, and there's a subway, and, and I said, I, had, I again, went going from... I went from rural Haiti to rural Siberia, or I guess Siberia is sort of by definition rural, but I went from rural Haiti to Siberia and there was no direct flight, and I get off the planes. That takes three days, by the way. Two days if you're lucky. But, um, and a lot of drugs. But, um, you know, you, I get off the plane and you're totally disoriented and, and, and there are subway tram, you know. And there are laboratories, and there are scientists, and it's, you know, it's, it, each of these places has been so different. That's the point of, the, of this thinking, trying to learn to listen to look poor people. Because it would have been easy for me to say, I am never coming back here. We have much more serious problems to deal with in Haiti, or, or why aren't we in Africa, or Tajikistan? Forget Russia. Um, but then you go into the prison, and you say, oh, it's the same people again. Like the guy who showed up at the Brigham four times, or the, the widow of, it's people who have social problems that are, and many of them are related to poverty. And so we found out, I mean, everywhere we've gone, the diseases that we've been taking on seem to be these sort of misery-seeking missiles uh, that are aiming at poor people. Now, the sermon audition, just to stick up for the title of my talk for a little bit, um, one of the things that I think we learned by this time, this is back in the, this was, I went there in 1998, and my, many of my colleagues uh, followed along thereafter, and again, by this time, Sonia Shin, that is, by the way, not a pastry chef in the background, but an eminent <laughs> medical school professor. But um, now, by this time, uh, Dr. Sonia Shin is, a, you know, is, is again a world renowned, I could mention many others, and for, and I, I don't know if the people from our clinical team are here tonight, but these people really know how to treat TV, and I, you know, again, I, I this is not, my, I, I, I'm not required, and there are also all these uh, Russian physicians. That's another thing about uh, discernment, is you say, well, if you decide that following the, the microbe trail leads you back to poor people, even in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a country like Russia, then well, what's the missing infrastructure? And it was not community health workers, and it was not hospitals. It wasn't even laboratories. And, and yet some of the things were similar. There was, uh, in fact, these, this epidemic was more... Was more, suggest, more like the ones I could describe to you in Boston or New York. 
a lot of um, co a lot of co uh, a lot of addiction, for example, to alcohol and drugs. Not like Haiti at all. Not like Guatemala. And there too, we saw the effects of bad policy, racism, um, gender inequality, and TB is an interesting story. It's very different from. Uh, HIV with intro close because in Russia and the United States, most people with TB are men. It's, it hits 80% sometimes. Now, why is that? What a great mystery. Because of policies. And which policies are those? Usually related to prison and, and punishment. And that's why this epidemic uh, took off in New York. It's why this epidemic took off in Siberia. And we'll save time to talk about this. Last example, back to Haiti. Um, I wanted to talk about diversity of leadership. Um, and uh, mention uh, some people who are leaders. Um, some, some of these people are conventional leaders. Like if you have a, a cardiothoracic surgeon from the Brigham go to rural Haiti and perform, perform the first open heart surgery there. I mean, that's, that, it's, it's not a conventional thing to do, mind you. It's remarkable. If it's the first time, it's always remarkable. But it, having a, you know, that, that doesn't shock you that a surgeon would do that from Harvard. Or a priest, a Haitian priest, um, building a school, that doesn't shock you. That's what, that's what they do. Or a Haitian doctor, who, this is one of the people who will be uh, here, the fellow in the middle with the shiny head. You can call him that when you see him, shiny head. He'll be here Saturday. He's Dr. Fernet Leon, who runs the AIDS program in Haiti. But over there, sitting on the pile of cement blocks, is, a, is, a very in, very, is an, another leader. And his name, and this is the last story I'll tell you, will be glad to hear. His name is Jean Gabriel Fils. And he's a very interesting guy, born in poverty, one of 18 children. Um, and I knew his family actually because his brother had tuberculosis. And, uh, and, and it was a sad story. It didn't, didn't go well. It was back in the day of, uh, in the dark days. And, but I, I knew a lot, a lot of the members of his family. I certainly knew his mother well, too. But I used to see him pretty regularly on Fridays because he would come back from this village this market village, and with these enormous sacks that he was carrying, and, and it, would, it would be food for the, now this is a medical complex now, and schools, and it would be food for us to eat, for the staff, the doctors and nurses, the patients too. And these huge, huge bags, talk about carrying a, a malnourished Haitian toddler, it, these things were enormous. And, uh, you know, we, we got to be friends, I told you, he's just, was very, he's very outgoing, and some of you have met him, um, he's very outgoing, this is maybe Five, only five or six years ago, I think, and um, and we got to be good friends. And once I was going back to for here a month on service, and I have a hobby gardening, I'll tell you, and um, and I and I, which is a silly hobby in Haiti. I mean, it, there's landless peasants. What a dumb hobby! I can't help it. Um, but I, mostly, in my defense, trees, um, which, which is not silly. I mean, Haiti's very deforested. Anyway. So I would ask people, you know, every time I'd go back here to be on service at the Brigham, I'd say to my neighbors, would you, who are peasant farmers, would you water my garden? I, I didn't want to call it my yard, which was just too embarrassing. It's tiny. I mean, it's, it's not that it's, it was grand. It's just that I'm the only person who has a yard. You know, they sweep their yards with brooms, and I wanted grass in mine. And, you know, and flowering plants and other things. So, and I'd come back and they would, they'd say, oh, sure, we'd be glad to, Dr. Paul. We love you. We love the medical care you give us here. You're our favorite. And I'd come back and the whole thing would be withered every time. <laughs> and, you know, someone would say, well, there was a water shortage. And I'd say, but there's a hose. Or, well, you know, the pigs got in. Oh, or I'm sorry. And, you know, in the end, I'd get kind of embarrassed. I, I thought, I'm not going to scold people who lost their land to a hydroelectric dam about not watering my ornamentals. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. So I asked this guy, Jean-Gabriel Fils, one time if he'd do it, and I came back and it was verdant. And I said to him, he goes by Tijan, I said, Tijan, I can't thank you enough, I'd really like to do something for you, but he's really high strung and I knew I shouldn't offer to pay him money. I, knew that, I, I suspected that might not be the thing to do. I mean, I could put it in an envelope and just give it to him, but I, I, did, I knew it would be crass. He's just that kind of guy. And I said, I'd really like to do something for you. And, and, and anything I could, I really am grateful for this. And he said, um, okay, then I'd like your computer. <laughs> so, as luck would have it, um, I had just received a new computer two days previously. Now, I don't know if he knew that. I don't think he could have, because it just returned and it was hidden away. And uh, maybe there's a, there's a mole inside Partners in Health, but I don't think so. And I said to him, 
So I, instead of just saying no, I immediately thought of that brand new computer with a DVD player actually okay. hidden away in my luggage. And I said, well, I, I'm ashamed to tell you that I said, well, what, what, what would you want with a computer? And he said, oh, I'll bet someone asked you that when you asked for your first computer, didn't they? <laughs> and I said, no, I, you're right. Okay, you can have my computer. <laughs> and so, anyway, that was only the beginning. Um, so then he, he proceeded to write a book um, on the computer, <laughs> which in, I think in two months he had 150 pages. I mean, I've got witnesses here who've seen, who've seen it. And you know, his chief complaints, as they say, as his chief complaints to me are likely to be, how many times do I have to tell you, Paul, I cannot use Windows 98. I want Windows 2000. <laughs> this is a guy who, only seven years ago, was, you know, carrying sacks for a living. Anyway, yes, he wrote a book. And then the next thing is he asked the director of Partisan Health to name him to the board, advisory board of Partisan Health. That was, and then he told me one time, he came up here with a patient once from staying at Elliott House. Didn't like it very much. I lived there. Didn't like it very much. I shouldn't have said that. Didn't like it very much, but, um, and left, you know, right after. But um, next thing I know, I was back in Haiti, and he, you know, he was doing a mix of work at the time. He was starting to work more with the doctors on patients who had lots of social problems. So that's what he wants to do. He wrote this book, and you know, we said, well, what do you want to do with your life? He said, I want to work for poor people. You know, what are you going to say? You are a poor person? No, don't. We said, great. Like what? He said, well, look at the way people live. You know, we're not animals. Every human is a human. They need houses. They need jobs. They need waters. So his title now is Jean Gabriel, Director, Project on Social and Economic Rights. And last time he came up here, by himself, he came back with little cards that said, on one side in English and on the other side in Haitian Creole, and with a cell phone number that I didn't recognize, <laughs> just that. Anyway, listening to the poor, um, is, has been for, for uh, I think, our group, the, the, really the compass of this work. And I want to close with some images. And uh, this is a, a leader. This is a community health worker. Actually, this picture was taken by a New York Times photographer. And, and he, I, I'm almost sure it's from him. And, uh, and I, she was on the cover of the New York Times. I guess it's not called the cover, but the front page. There, there's even other terms like above the fold or something. I was, someone said, it's above the fold. And I was thinking, does that mean? Is that good or bad? But I brought it back to her, and she looked at it and said, oh, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> anyway, this is one of those community health workers. And the same day that this picture was taken, which it was an early day, I wasn't there, uh, this was a... I showed her this picture. This was taken by the same guy. This actually is on the New York Times website because I saw, this is when she first saw these. I was showing to them, her on the website because lots of peasants now in that village know how to use computers. And and when she looked at it, she didn't say, "Oh, there I am on the website." She said, "You know, um, you wouldn't know which of the two of us had AIDS and which of us didn't if I didn't tell you." That's what she said. I said, "You're right." And. Um, and, she, and this is a woman who takes care of her neighbors. That's her form of le leadership in health care. She has all of the m medications for the people in that village right in her house, in her, usually in her bag. Hi, the same woman after only two months of antiretroviral therapy. A young woman who's just learned that day that her baby does not have HIV, although she does, because she was part of a successful program to make sure that the virus was not transmitted. Or here's one of our community health workers in 1999 dying at home of AIDS and a few years later at a patient at the party, uh, a party the patients were throwing. Um, and you can see her words heard yourself. Another person on the day, actually I was just with a medical student who took these two pictures. She's now in I think a, her fourth year. She was working in, with me in Haiti and, and the day this guy came in and she took this, uh, both, both pictures as I said and he was part of a project we were doing to interview patients uh, and we were talking about stigma and he was, you know, the patients there were saying, stigma, well, how about we start by making it not a lethal disease and then we'll talk. And then one, this fellow who, whose name impossibly is Holy Heart, saint -Cœur, and uh, is part of the same project dying of AIDS, taller, taller than I am, weighing 80-something pounds, and then a couple years later. 
saw him last week in clinic, not because he was sick, but because he wanted something to fix his soldering machine. <laughs> a woman dying of AIDS, same woman giving a health and human rights declaration in a conference a year, a year, a year later. And this, this declaration you can read about, you can, it's on the Partners in Health website in several languages, of course. They gave it in Haitian, and it's been translated somewhat poorly into French and English and Spanish, but you can read it on the PAH website. And then I won't apologize for this last picture, but when I think about leadership and the challenges before us, I do think a lot about AIDS. This is a person who has both AIDS and TB, the number one and two cause, infectious causes of young adult death in the world today, and this is his mother. And you know, talk about leadership, all the leadership that women like she have, have offered us in not giving up. Because this is the same guy five months later. And I think I'll close there and I look forward to brisk debate and, and, and critique. Thank you very much. chest pain, I do have my stethoscope right here. <laughs> So I thank you for saying that. I'm very grateful. I just, the, the, I came from, a, I said a woman's room on, at the hospital. And um, her son had died of AIDS. And she, she, she said to me almost that when, you know, she would, her, her condition has nothing to do with HIV. But she just said, you know, if only, you know, if only 10 years ago. Yeah, uh, yes, please. You know, we were just in your beautiful country recently, the director of Partners in Health and I were just there. And we were around the, first of all, you know, you fly into Nairobi, which is, of course is so different from Port-au-Prince. It's this big skyscrapers and, you know, and, and it's, or, it's very, it's, it looks like a rich city. And we know that Kenya is not a rich country, but it's, it's, the disparities hit you. Like, I, I showed, um, you know, I, I have this picture of, of Nairobi and then, you know, a village in Kenya. I'm from the same trip. This is January, by the way. And then we went to Lake Victoria, where we saw what you described. All these children and all these elderly people, but no one in between. And, and I have to say that we were there um, to, 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 ar to make an argument. And it's been, it was a very difficult argument because we were, the, we were guests, but we weren't arguing with Africans. We were arguing, again, with people just like us. They were, they were you know, it doesn't matter what organization, a good organization. But they were, they had started a home-based care program in this region where HIV was a is a terrible problem and it has been. And they, they had started, um, uh, they had started this home-based care program, but they had not included any, any ARVs. So they had, that means that these are the drugs that are specific and, and the ones that I, I think. Um, and um, 
they had, they told us, one group of, told us, well, we enrolled, you know, I think it was 1,300 people just a couple years ago. And we said, great, for home-based care. And we said, great, how they do them? And, you know, I think it was more than half of them were dead. So we had to find a way to say, we dig the home base part, it's the care that isn't right. Because you can't care for this disease without the tools. Why are Kenyan doctors and nurses fleeing the teaching hospitals of Nairobi? You know, one of, one of my former students, a, a good friend, who's an, who's a psychiatrist now, uh, did a study of this with uh, Kenyan colleagues. And, you know, the, the nurses and doctors in Kenyatta teaching hospitals don't have the tools. So why wouldn't they go to, you know, Zambia and then South Africa and then to Canada, you know, UK, then Canada and here? Why? I know I wouldn't be able to do this work without tools, and nor can my Haitian, Russian, uh, Peruvian, Roxburyan uh, co-workers that we just can't work without them. So in answer to your question, which is a hard question, another former student of mine from Tanzania is here. He's always asking me the same question. Now I ask him the question, by the way. What are you going to help me out? But um, we have been, and, and again, I, the, our medical director, some of you have heard her speak, Dr. Joy Mukherjee is just a, a force of nature, but um, we're, what we're tr doing now is trying to work, I mean, in a way that was a consultancy, right? I and mean, we, didn't, we, did, we, did, we did it as volunteers. We went to Kenya uh, as volunteers, or, and, and to Rwanda, and to South Africa, and other places. But what we'd like to do is, is use this, is have this model be used elsewhere, because when you have good community-based care that is done by community health workers, then you're not going to, you can't say, well, sorry, there are no community health workers in rural Africa. It's not true. They're all over the place. You can't say there are no people. They're, you know, and, and so that's been part of the struggle. Now, part of the struggle has been going to be with the establishment in Kenya, because the, including the medical establishment, because it's, it's very, you know, you, it's a very lofty and rarefied setting there. I mean, I had a friend who was intubated for a year in Nairobi, you know, with a mechanical ventilation because she's an American scholar. And I that had never been to Kenya at the time. And I said, I didn't know that things like that existed because I had only worked in Haiti at the time. There's no mechanical ventilation in Haiti for a year, I'll tell you. But there's some very fancy places, as you know, in your country. So I think people like you who are doing leadership and working with who are listening to people living in poverty, who would have told us years ago, as they did, listen, this approach towards AIDS, it says, okay, so care for some people, no care for others, or this kind of medicine for some people, antibacterials for poor people, and everything for others. It's just not going to work as policy. It, it's, it's, it's the way the world is, but it's not where we should set policy. That, that, that would be the argument. I think we'll get that most closely by listening to the African poor. You know, I've met ministers in, uh, in Africa, I won't mention which country, not yours, but who said, well, you know, this is absurd, we really can't be sinking money into this. We just, and then you ask them more if you're, I mean, I don't, I'm not sassy to ministers, but um, <laughs> cabinet members. But you, then you'll find out that the IMF, say, has told them they have to cap their social spending. And then you find out 4,000 Kenyan nurses get laid off, you know, and, and it's related to some international... I'm saying IMF, I'm not sure I'm right on that, but we'd have to check it out. But it's not, we're all in this, is basically what I'm saying. And, and, and this, this place could provide a lot of leadership by listening to the poor. Everybody. It's good. Do you Um, I'll repeat the question, do I agree that the invidious status of women uh, is a major factor all over the place in, in terms of HIV? And if I do, what is our organization doing about it? Well, you know, though the short answer is yes, and, and I hope a lot. For example, our, our group was the first to write a book called Women, Poverty, and AIDS, just about that topic alone. Um, and that was, in, that, was in, that was 10 years ago. And, um, and, and it's been an uphill struggle. Uh, a, a woman's group in Haiti who did a project with us said, you want women not to die of AIDS, give them jobs. So one of the things that we've done, and you saw the last slide said a virtuous social cycle question mark, is to, to take that seriously and try and create jobs for women and try and make sure that land tenure issues and literacy and access to schooling for girls, that these are not just things we talk about in seminar rooms, 
or debates, but, but things that really happen. Now, we're a tiny organization. Yeah, I mean, you'd be sh shocked to see hear how small Partners in Health is. It's a very small organization. Harvard, however, is a little bit larger. <laughs> and using the symbolic capital, and, and, we, and we think real capital, that Harvard has and can move into global health is going to be a major, uh, it's going to be very important. So when you say, what is our group doing? Well, I, you know, Harvard's also our group as well. You know, I'm, I'm, it's part of my group. And I think that we, you know, from the president to the student body, to the people who work here keeping this place spick and span, that there's a lot that this university has to offer in the struggle for equity in general, and global health equity in particular. And we shouldn't shy away from using those words, you know, equity, social justice, because they're central to the problem. And they're central to the problem in, in Kenya. Because there are resources that could have been spared, sh shared more equitably. There are, you know, land tenure issues around gender that could have been addressed through legislation. There are, and the list goes on and on. So I'd like to think my answer would be yes and a lot but we're not going to add up to much because we're too small if there's not a movement and powerful institutions behind us. Thank you. Yes? To what extent have you seen um, international health organizations like the World Health Organization respond to the examples of your projects and begin to incorporate some of your Well, since one of my best friends is now heading up this, this effort at the World Health Organization, I have to say a lot. You know, it's sort of like, it, it's sort of like that example of the pharmaceutical company just expecting them to say no, 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 and then they say yes. Well, you know, uh, the director of the World Health, the executive director, director general, got to get these terms right at the K school. The director general of the WHO believes in this, and certainly Jim Kim. Again, and I encourage you all of you to listen to to Jim speak about this. Um, these are people who really believe in this effort. And so, you know, again, and I, I share this, this message particularly with students. I teach it mostly at the medical school, but I teach undergraduates and sometimes, and, and certainly people at school of public health. I share this a lot with them. You know, we, we really have to be careful not to underestimate what, what we can do. And that sounds like such an American thing to say, you know. Um, but, you know, Partners in Health was started by student activists, you know, who were in their early 20s. And, and you know this project that you saw, community-based HIV care, was started by um, rural peasants, and who said no. You know, who said we, your job, find the meds, will help make sure that the strategy gets worked out. And it's being run by the. You know, during this recent coup in Haiti, um, we, as far as we can tell, not a single dose of ARV meds were missed in our project area. That's good. And that's not because the roads weren't blocked and uh, four of our ambulances weren't seized by the rebels of which the New York Times seems so enamored. Um, but that's because community people, people living in these communities, delivered the care. You know, and uh, they provided this leadership and they knew it was important. It wasn't orders from above. Yes? Prioritization of mental health in, in resource poor settings. Well, for our group, it's very important because, of course, we, as I said earlier at the beginning of this, it's not about a policy strategy, but rather about listening to the poor and then having the process of discernment go forward. So we can't not be interested in something that's afflicting people living in poverty. And if you, and that's why, why I think you know, Chris. Some of you know Chris Murray and some of the work that he did here, but even before he went to the World Health Organization, and now is back to head up global health equity here at Harvard was to try and look forward and see what, what's the burden of disease in poor countries and mental health 
pathologies, major depressive disorder, um, among them suicide, are at, way up in the top ten and they're just moving up. And so what, what, what our group is trying to say is community-based care like this is an excellent model for any con chronic illness for which there is a deliverable. That deliverable may be an antidepressant, it may be seizure medication, it may be, you know, uh, again, treatment for tuberculosis or HIV, etc. Something for which there is a deliverable over time. Now, this is, there's lots to be said about maternal mortality and cervical cancer, etc. And we, our group works very hard on those, we, we do a lot, a lot of work on those problems. But this is the argument we're trying to make. And you've heard us sometimes use this silly term, CHIPS, Complex Health Interventions in Poor Settings. Well, we didn't call it resource poor settings because chirp sounded even worse. <laughs> but the idea is that this could be useful for many chronic problems, in, in, in including and in, in, in very notably mental health problems. Now, that's, that's uh, about treatment, and we're about tre integrating treatment and prevention. And, you know, mental health problems are related to, again, I, I don't know. I, mean, it's, I, was, I was about to say are related, are related to these obscene social inequalities that we see everywhere. I probably shouldn't say that because there's someone who no doubt has written a 10,000 page thesis on that here at the K School. But, you know, I believe that. So I, I don't think any of these problems are going to go away while the world is in the, in its, on its current trajectory. Yes? Well, it's actually a not a debate between breastfeeding and formula feeding. It's a debate between policymakers, as you know, who don't have HIV themselves. And again, uh, uh, you know, listening to people living in poverty, women living in poverty in particular, if you say to someone who's in your clinic in Haiti, you can transmit HIV to your daughter through breastfeeding, and then the next thing is, well, what am I going to give my kid? And you say, um, well, there, there's, there's milk substitute. And they say, well, where am I going to get that? And is it, again, is the beginning of a discussion or the end of one? Because if your answer is, well, we have a program um, that provides that for women living with HIV who um, take antiretrovirals during pregnancy, who don't, who, who don't themselves have advanced HIV disease and need three drugs. Um, and then they say, well, how am I going to mix it? Where am I going to get the water? And we, we can say, I think with some pride, we have, a, we have an engineer also, a Haitian engineer, who does water projects. And if you're not in one of those areas where he's worked, we have pre-mixed formula. So I, I, that answers the question to what I think about it. I think deciding that the answer is that for some women and some of their children, HIV positive, HIV positive breast milk is an acceptable policy answer is wrong. I don't think it's an acceptable policy answer. What it is is, a, is, a, is an assessment of the way the world is, that's all. But it is not, we don't aim policies down, we aim them up. And so, I mean, you can see where I stand on it. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, I'm still unhappy um, that we had a project that was funded by an organization, which I won't name, but it's based in New York, um, and uh, was, which, where they suddenly cut off our, our breast milk substitute. Now, it's not easy for a small charity like Partners in Health to say, okay, now we'll get that from contented cows in Holland tomorrow. You know, we were really counting on that milk. What am I going to do? Explain to women who come in for their milk and who have taken the ARBs all throughout the third trimester that suddenly a policy change in New York has made it such that this intervention is no longer considered safe, cost-effective, or appropriate to resource poor settings? <laughs> you know, I'm not going to say that. So it's, it's, it's hard. It, and I think, you know, I'm not saying that I'm wrong and they're right. I am right. <laughs> I mean, but you know, it's not so much that I'm saying that. What I'm saying is, I just think that if policymakers spent more time listening to people living in poverty, some of their, some of our, not their, some of our interventions would be just a little bit more clever and effective and innovative and, and would have HIV positive milk not be part of the solution. Yes. It used to be the HIV of several decades ago and how did you motivate so many people to to work in these community settings when a disease like HIV carries so much stigma with it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because leprosy, which as you know is on the, on the, on the de decline for reasons that are not entirely clear to the infectious disease and epidemiology experts, but one of the reasons is because a lot of people who were, had leprosy were just reclassified as not having active disease. So as a very good friend of mine said, hey, 
I made that decision. I kind of just wiped out leprosy in one day. <laughs> anyway, um, look really hard and find out who that was, and you'd be surprised. Anyway, he or she is a, in a, now in a very influential position in the World Health Organization. Um, that wasn't Jim. Um, but in any case, you know, stigma, it's, uh, it's really interesting to me. A stigma in Haiti was very tightly tied to the fact that it was a death sentence. And so when people came back, you know, we started calling it the Lazarus effect, in part because one of the patients kept on saying, oh, I'm a Lazarus, I'm a second Lazarus, I'm a second. And he just started doing public speaking about his experience on ARBs. And he, actually a guy from National Public Radio, who I, who I was not here, but he lives in Boston, uh, Richard Knox, some of you have heard of him, he's a science reporter, he used to write for the Globe. He ca and he came to the Brigham where I was and said, oh, I can tell you, it's, just, it's his job to be a skeptic, same as the New York Times person, it's not, who came down to Haiti, they're just skeptical that peasants, and I'm not saying that peasants could run something like this, but that it could work in real Haiti. And he said, I'd like to come down, this was before UNGAS, so when was UNGAS? It was like two, four years ago. It was the United Nations General Assembly, special session on AIDS. And um, he wanted to come down beforehand, and he met this patient, and, and he didn't want me to translate. They had to have a different translator. I was, couldn't have the doctor be the translator. So I was listening to these stories instead of telling them, instead of translating. And I get kind of worked up emotionally when I hear these pa the patients talking. Um, and, uh, and this was happening to me every time. You know, I was feeling, I'd hear them tell the story, and I'd, I'd start, you know, having to stare at the ground or draw circles in the dirt or something. And this guy was saying, well, you know, I was coming back, and we're in front of his house, dirt floor, and, uh, and there's a woman with the mic. See, because if it's NPR, they have to have a sound person. I said, can't you just come by yourself? It's a clinic. He said, it's radio, National Public Radio. And then I thought, right. And then she, she, he wanted to bring a producer set too, and I said, no, no, come on, three people in a clinic? And so he said, okay, the pr producer will be a sound person. She was great. But any time it would start raining, she'd go, oh, ambient rain noise. And then she'd run out and go, <laughs> yeah. And I hate chickens, you know. I hate chickens. I'm just afraid of them. But because they make so much noise, and she would just love the noises that the chickens were making. As punishment for that, I will keep this anecdote up for one more hour. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, so she, they were interviewing him, and I was sitting a far away away, and there was a fantastic... Uh, translator was doing the translating, and I and it was beautiful. And uh, he said, "I'm a second Lazarus. I came home. I was dying. I bought my coffin." And Richard Knox, God bless him, said, "Can I see your coffin?" <laughs> and I almost choked. And I thought I would never in a million years say that. And you know, the, pa the patient said, "Sure, I'd love to show you my coffin." <laughs> and so up they go. And I, and I later said to Richard Knox, "You know, Richard, I would ne I would have thought that would be a rude question. This is back to stigma." And he, and he, but he, he nailed it, he, you know, through a translator. He said, oh, I'd love to. And so if you, he wrote me an email from New York or Washington or wherever NPR is. And I was in Haiti and he said, look on the NPR website. There's a picture of Senecar's coffin in there. And there was, I'm sure it's still there. I mean, I don't know if you can erase the web. The web. Can you erase that stuff? <laughs> anyway, I'd like to erase some of it. But uh, stigma was a problem in Haiti because of, there's a death sentence. And, you know, the more the treatment we've done, the more people want BCT. Here, it was very complicated about racism as well. Haitians here, it's about Haiti's relation to the United States. So I, I just would say that it's, stigma is a very complex phenomenon. It's related to political economies and things we often don't talk about, including access to care, and that there's lots of ways to alter it. That would be my claim. Yes. Embrace what you're doing, but also feel threatened by it. How do you handle the um, local competition for power? Oh, the there's community? a long line of people in rural Haiti just dying to lead health projects. Um, we see that the competition, the competition is is really um, I'm not competing with them. You know what I mean? They, and they wouldn't see, you know, uh, say. Um, for a lot of the people that I work with, actually, they think that Boston and that Harvard's in Miami. You know, I haven't disabused them of this. And they say, are you going to Miami? I say, yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's not, we're not the center of their universe, you know. And so they don't, I'm not in competition, I mean, I, I'm not, uh, the leadership that, that we'd give, that it would be in competition with another peer, uh, another f fellow physician, you know, a Haitian physician. But, he, you know, Dr. Leon, the guy I showed you, he, 
I, it's it's completely different. I understand my role would be, will all, my leadership role will always be different as an American working in Russia or Haiti. Again, Guatemala, where my country had a large hand in the in the de devastation that I described to you. So I think again, discernment. You know, listening, I won't say audition again, but just uh, listening and discernment, thinking through this, I think uh, will, will lead a servant, someone who wants to serve the poor, on a path where you really don't find yourself with a lot of co competition, but with ra rather with a lot more help. You know, they, 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 you've heard all these proverbs, and the Haitians have a million of them, uh, many hands make like work, you know, and variations on that theme. So, Perhaps we, in, in deference to Dr. Farmer's uh, schedule on the many miles he's traveled. We have one more question. I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, I lived in a caucus for several years and I was actually... The Iowa caucuses? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I was actually in like, so Well, I, the, I promise a short version of that because it's complex and I can lay it out for you afterwards. But we ended up, uh, let me do the, uh, the truth, is we ended up, we were looking for money for our work in Haiti and Peru. You know, don't go asking billionaires for money because they're not billionaires for nothing. <laughs> so, the, and, uh, so we went to one particular billionaire who I will not name but who is highly involved in the region of the world you just noted. And he said to me, he said, no, we don't work in Peru, but can you help us in Tomsk? So, and I, you know, initially, but then I went there, like I said, you know, you listen, and I, I, I you know, these were, the prisoners were, I'm sorry, but they, they were our people. You know, they, 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 they struck me in some way that I can't really define very clearly yet, um, as somehow sharing some of the same struggles that I'd seen in Roxbury, and Guatemala, and Haiti, and Peru. And uh, that's how we ended up there, looking for money for other projects. But you know, you get drawn into compelling situations. And our, and our project was narrow because there was a lot of personnel and, and there were a lot of resources there. And our intervention was pretty technical and specific because there, you know, go to Haiti and there's nothing, right? There's no water, there's no schools, there's no... But you go to uh, Tomsk and there's, as I told you, a tram train and a 150-year-old medical school and people who you know, I've seen more x-rays in, you know, in a week than, you know, more TV x-rays in a week than they'd see in a year at the Brigham. So, that's why. That's how. I'm not going anywhere. I mean, I just worry for others. Yeah. Could you just talk a little bit about what it's like in Haiti right now? Well, it's about 84 degrees and cloudy. <laughs> no. Well, it's sad. You know, it's very sad. I mean, let me, again, I only speak as an American, it's very sad, but, you know, I'm, I'm a great admirer of the Haitian people and their 200-year-long struggle. You know, to me, if you look at modernity, you know, a lot of the notion of modernity comes from Haiti. That is, Haiti's the only country ever born out of a slave revolt. It's the only country that, it's the first country to outlaw slavery. Named itself a, a safe haven, not only for slaves here in the United States, but for Native Americans. This is pretty forward thinking back in 1791 to 1803, when, the, when 1804 is when the official date, but 200 years. So, but the, for many years there's been a struggle towards constitutional democracy in Haiti. And it looked like it might happen in 87, it finally did. There were real elections in 1990, another coup, then uh, elections again. And then finally the first handoff from one civilian to another on the day it was supposed to happen. Only happened, it's only happened once in Haiti twice now. And so, if you were in any way, forget about the politics and all the things that you hear screamed in this room sometimes, forget about that for a second and say, do you like the idea of one person, one vote? Do you like the idea, not you personally, but does one like the idea of one person, one vote? Does one like the idea that people who are peasants and don't have shoes should also, if they want to stand in line and vote, get to vote? And if you do, you're going to be pretty sad about, you know, the loss of constitutional democracy in Haiti. I mean, none of the people there are elected, you know, and so that's, 
That's hard, I think, for people who live in poverty in Haiti. I mean, clearly there's vast cheerleading numbers. Uh, the the well-to-do Haitians are not sad about it. We, you can hear that in a at Harvard just as easily as you can in, in, in uh, Port Prince, but you can't hear where I live. You know, you just hear your people saying, I heard someone said to me in the clinic last Thursday, I'm never going to vote again because I'm, I'm tired of being insulted like this. Why should I vote again? Every time I vote for someone, they just overthrow the, you know, the people we vote for. One day we're going to take a good long look at that and feel really sorry as a people, me, Americans, I think. And that'll be that day of reckoning. I mean, it'll be interior because we're so powerful and they're so poor. But I think, you know, and we'll be thinking of words like penitence and, you know, regret. You mean for things like the embargo? Yes, exactly. You know, blocking humanitarian aid and water. And I mean, to the, a country, you know, if there's a, I'm sure you all read the Water Poverty Index and get that at home. But <laughs> the University of the United Kingdom has something called the Center for Hydrology, and they, they issued the Water Poverty Index, and they ranked 147 countries, and Haiti was 147. And we were, at the time, actively blocking water assistance to Haiti. I mean, come on. You don't have to be a doctor who doesn't like typhoid to say, what's wrong with this picture? And one day, you know, one day the real story will, will be told. Dr. Okay. Farmer, could we ask if you might agree to come back again one day? Anytime. I would love to come back. I'm, I'm, right, I'm right across the river. Good. Yeah. Thank you for being in this world. <laughs>